Hey guys, what is going on? Welcome back to another video. In this video, we're gonna be talking about diameter versus length of brushless motors. If you're sourcing a motor for your specific application, do you want to put a motor in there that has a larger diameter or a larger length in order to maximize the amount of power output or other parameters that you could possibly get out of that motor? That's exactly what we're gonna break down in this video. We're going to have a comparison between, for example, a 28 millimeter versus a 36 millimeter motor. And you can see that the green motor is actually has a longer length and that 36 millimeter has a shorter length. Which motor would perform better? Both of them, let's say, would be of the same weight. What we're wondering is what happens in either one of these cases? Well, first thing that we're gonna do is look at diameter specifically. We're gonna compare a motor A versus a motor B, where motor A is that 36 millimeter motor, for example, and motor B is that, let's say, 28 millimeter motor. We've picked a nice simple round number to use as a force that is generated at a very specific location within this brushless motor. This is between the windings that is within the motor on the stator and the rotor. That force that is generated is generated by the interaction of the magnets and the windings and that force point that is acting in this direction perpendicular to the center point is going to act at a radius of 12 millimeters. This is for the case of motor A. In our smaller motor, we would expect that that magnet, having the north and south pole, is going to be smaller in our smaller motor. Makes sense, right? This one's gonna have a radius of seven millimeters. Now what we need to do is we need to take all this information and figure out what kind of output can we get from either one of those cases when the force generated by the interaction of the magnets as well as the coils produces a force of one Newton in both of those motors. We look at case A and what we're interested in is the torque that we are able to produce from that force. In order to produce torque or define torque, torque is equal to our force that we have multiplied by that distance. That's the importance to the radius. That's the distance away that that force acts on in order to produce that moment arm. Torque is equal to, we're now subbing the values in, we get one Newton multiplied by our 12 millimeters, which gives us a torque output of 12 Newton millimeters. In the case of motor B, we have one Newton multiplied by the seven millimeter distance. That's gonna give us a total torque output of seven Newton millimeters. What we've determined here is that that larger motor is able to produce more torque output, even though it generates the same amount of force acting on each one of those motors for both examples. If we assume that these motors have an equal length, which is necessary in order to determine the torque output that we've already calculated, and we assume that these motors produce the same amount of RPM, which entirely is possible specifically for these motors, generally they would be limited to something around 60,000 RPM, we would get more power potential from motor A. Well, how does this make sense mechanically? Well, mechanically, it might be obvious to us that if we are able to produce the same amount of force, much like what we're doing when we torque the lug nuts on our car, and we have a greater moment arm, we can generate greater amounts of torque. This makes sense. How about electrically? How does it make sense electrically that this relationship still applies? Well, if you look at the area that surrounds the circumference of both of those rotors, one of the things that's important, even if we keep the same thickness of coil around this motor as well as around this motor, we can travel a greater difference using the circumference of this motor for motor A. Therefore, we can shove in there more copper windings in order to produce more power output. If you increase the amount of copper, you could increase the potential for either more amounts of voltage, provided that your KV is lower, or you can produce more potential for current flow at a higher level in motor A. And that's electrically how we get more power out of A versus B. Now what happened if we look at an example where we have a motor that varies in length and now we keep the, the diameter constant, which is the inverse of what we just looked at here. Well, what we need first is to know how much torque we're gonna produce for every millimeter in length that we go. This is going to be based on this value here, 12 Newton millimeters per every millimeter of length that we add. 
What we need to know then is the actual lengths of the motors that we're going to go and compare. Motor A is going to be at a length of 65 millimeters, where motor B is going to be at a length of 50 millimeters. Next thing to do is to look at our formula. Torque is equal to the torque constant that we're going to use per unit of length multiplied by the actual length that we have for each motor. We go ahead, substitute our values in. Torque is equal to the 12 that we have up here multiplied by the 65 millimeters in length, and we get about 780 newton millimeters of torque output. For motor B, we have torque is equal to 12 multiplied by 50, and we get 600 newton millimeters. It's quite obvious to see that our formula really just relied, since we know TL was the same, the only thing remaining in our formula was L and L being larger is gonna produce the larger amount of torque. Now, how does that make sense mechanically? Well, we know that that rotor is going to increase in length, and we know if we apply a force to more amounts of length, we can generate higher amounts of torque. Well, the same idea happens when we look at it from an electrical standpoint, very similar to what we did in comparison with our diameters. Here we are adding copper windings around the circumference. However, here we're gonna actually add copper winding in the length. Now we go ahead, add more copper, and we can get the exact same electrical results there as we did with our diameter. The next thing to look at is our conclusions to let us know what are we gonna actually choose. Are we looking for motors that are longer in length, or are we looking for motors that are larger in diameter? Well. What we've learned is that diameters and lengths, if you increase one or the other, we're gonna increase the amount of potential for torque output to increase, which really can also mean for us the total amount of power output can increase as well, as long as both of those motors being compared can hit the same amount of RPM. Since our mechanical formula for power is equal to the torque multiplied by rotational speed. This is where things get a little bit more interesting and a little more specific to our applications that we're going to use. Similar motors in weight produce similar power outputs. That is interesting because if you take a motor and compare it with another motor, it doesn't matter whether the diameter is significantly different than the length in comparison of the other motor or vice versa. As long as the weights are similar, you're gonna get very similar power outputs. There's gonna be no advantage to having a larger diameter or a larger length in this case. Let's quickly cut over to a comparison that we make here on the computer. Here we have two comparisons between two different motors in each comparison. In our first comparison, we have a 28 millimeter diameter motor compared up against a 36 millimeter diameter motor, where the length of our smaller motor is at 64 and the length of our larger motor is at 50 millimeters. We can see that we've kept the amount of weight as close as we could possibly match it, and then we went into the listing of all the different wines and picked a wine that provides us with very similar KV values. This way we can have a fair comparison across all the parameters for each example. You can see from this example, the motor manufacturer says we have about 1300 watts of peak power that you can produce from this motor. Now you guys know that I don't like peak power. I do prefer continuous power. I would expect the continuous power to be closer to about 600 watts for each one of these motors based off of their peak value. Now for the current, both of these motors have actual identical amounts of current as rated by the specification sheet and the voltage. I'd imagine this is a rounding difference 21 volts versus 20 volts when you consider the difference in the KV where this one here has a smaller KV probably rounding it a little bit higher as I would expect the maximum RPM that these motors can run at is about 60,000 RPM. It gets more interesting as we look further at the parameters. Our IO value, this is the no load current is actually identical in each case. However, the RM value is quite significantly different for our smaller diameter motor. It has a higher RM value and our larger diameter motor has a lower uh, value here for RM. Now, both of these motors, according to the specification sheet, should perform very equal to one another. I would not expect to see much of a difference in actuality when using both of these motors. Each one of them has the potential to produce 
the same amount of power. Now, when you look at the total surface area, if I had to make a decision, if both of these fit in my application, I would make the decision based off of surface area. What can dissipate more amounts of heat to the environment? In this case, I would expect based off of running these calculations that the total surface area for the motor of a 36 millimeter diameter and a length of 50 millimeters because it gives off the most amount of surface area and keep in mind this comes from the end surface area this is important because the along the can length it's actually equal if you have the potential to provide heat to the atmosphere on the ends of the motor this is the motor that could dissipate that heat a little bit better giving you the advantage to possibly go faster but at the end of the day you have to be pretty darn serious in order to get down to this level or even looking at the difference between these rm values the reason i wouldn't go with the rm value is because i don't know how accurate or what the motor manufacturer has done to make these that much different from each other I would not expect them to be that different. However, this is the numbers that we have been provided and we have to treat them as if they are all correct. That's our assumption. If we now then look at our second comparison, we have a motor diameter of 29 with a length of 79 and a diameter of 40 with a length of 53. You can see that the wattage here is actually quite different where we have one motor rated at 1800 watts where the other one is rated at 1500 watts. However, if you do the multiple between the current and the voltage of each one of these, you get a very close number between those maximums that they have provided. This is a hard stop in terms of the voltage, but I know the motor manufacturer is relatively conservative on their current values for these motors. One motor is rated at 55 amps for the smaller diameter motor and 51 amps for the larger diameter motor. And again, we kept the KV as close as possible to have a fair comparison. And we also kept the weight of these motors as close as possible as it would actually allow for us. If you look at the other remaining parameters, we have our RM value. Here we actually have identical RM values and the difference in this case for our IO value is that the smaller diameter motor has a higher IO value. Generally speaking, IO values when they're different, it's not going to be much of a problem for us as long as we're not operating on the very low end of the range of power potential from this motor. You don't want to be running this motor, for example, to use it for 50 watts. You want to use this motor so that it produces somewhere up above 600 watts or so of power. Now, what's really interesting, like we said, is the wattage is different. If we look at surface area of this motor, our smaller diameter motor actually has a much greater can surface area this is again along the length of the cam on the surface of that can it has a larger surface area there the end surface area is actually smaller on the ends of the motor can where the total surface area even though is still larger on the smaller motor now if i had to pick between these motors now again if you are the hardcore guy that has to pick between these using the best judgment i would go based off of surface area. Being able to dissipate that heat to the environment through greater amounts of surface area is always going to be a helpful thing, especially if you use a heat sink and can utilize that can surface area in order to get that heat sink to work better for you because the end surface area for that smaller diameter motor is not going to be as large as the other one. Our third point that we're looking at is the application is more dependent on the size versus power output. What I really am meaning right here is that if you have an application and you're trying to stuff this massive diameter motor into it, but you simply don't have the room, but yet you have so much more room and length behind it, what you wanna do is fit it according to what physically fits in that space. Pick one that is larger and use a smaller diameter. The last one that we have up on the board here is a bunch of motor variables and constants. The first one is KV. If we were to keep the KV constant for our larger motor versus the smaller motor, we can then look at what changes for the rest of these values. If we look at that value, keeping the KV the same in both of these examples, so we have a 36 millimeter motor, but we have a larger length versus a smaller length, the voltage is actually going to stay the same. KT is based off of KV, it's just the inverse. Because KV is the same, KT is also going to be the same for both of those motors. 
For these next bunch of variables, IO, RM, and current, this is where things get a little bit interesting. IO represents the amount of current that a motor consumes when there is no load applied. And that would typically be done by a manufacturer at a constant voltage. It doesn't matter what that voltage is, it's going to be held constant for all of their tests for a specific motor. Now IO, because this motor is larger, it's gonna have more copper in there, it's gonna have also a larger rotor, therefore it's also gonna have more resistance to keep that mass rotating under the frictional loads, you would expect to have a higher IO value. Keep in mind, IO is wasted power. You're gonna be wasting more power by operating at no load if you have a very small amount of load that you'd apply to that. It's not good to oversize your motor significantly if you plan on really only having a small amount of load being applied to it. It's very rare that we would encounter this in our RC applications where IO is really that much of a, a big deal for us. RM is going to be different. We're gonna have a lower internal resistance in motor A in comparison to motor B. How do we know that? Well, the KVs are the same. If KV is the same, the only thing that can change for RM is for it to decrease because we know we're gonna have more copper. We can increase the amount of copper, reducing the amount of internal resistance when our KV is the same. Now, if we look at the last item here, which is current, and we relate it back to our RM value, we can pass a higher amount of current through the motor because our RM value is lower. I hope you enjoyed the video. Like the video if you do, and don't forget to hit that subscribe button so that I can see you in that next video. Thanks a lot for watching and I'll see you next Monday.